introduction. Oh, yeah. But he does need an introduction for the younger people. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, um, because he's such a legend in my mind um, that uh, uh, I, I feel like he doesn't need an introduction. But uh, uh, Dr. Biggers tells me that this is the anniversary of 50 years of working on cell culture media. Wow. And so the next 50 years, you have to work on the bovine culture media. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, uh, Dr. Bigger has got his uh, PhD and his DSc from the University of London in physiology. And then he uh, came to this country and joined the faculty at the veterinary school at the University of Pennsylvania. And af after that, he moved to Johns Hopkins, um, where he was in um, the School of Public Health. Well, the School of Hygiene? Actually, the School of, the school of Hygiene, but I guess these days it's public health. And then um, in 1971, he moved to Harvard. And I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Biggers when I was a postdoc at Yale in 1970. I was doing a postdoc with uh, Clem Margaret, who unfortunately is no longer with us. But uh, Dr. Biggers came to Yale, and as I said to him, I remember him because he was this great famous scientist who came, but he didn't remember me, but uh, I was just a postdoc in the lab. But um, uh, the first paper that I looked at when I started out my postdoc was the 1968 paper by Witten and Biggers, which is growing mouse embryos in chemically defined medium. And that just seemed like an amazing thing that one could do. You didn't have to add any serum. You didn't have to do, add any undefined factors. And so uh, we're lucky to have Dr. Biggers here today to tell us um, uh, where this all came from and where we are today. So, thank you. Thank you, Carol, for <coughs> an introduction. And you asked me to talk for 30 minutes. I see the program says 50 minutes. <laughs> so I'll try and go. <laughs> it wasn't personal, John. <laughs> <laughs> I have questions. Pleasure to, to come and talk here today <coughs> about a subject I've thought about for many years, as you've uh, heard. <coughs> I guess most people think people of my age are only good for reminiscing about the past. And I am going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not doing it for nostalgic reasons. Uh, people use, can use media to culture eggs and embryos and cells these days. They can buy them commercially. And very few people ever think what's in those media and what they might be doing to the cells or embryos that you're culturing, whether they are in fact uh, influencing the results of the experiments in an unexpected way. So <clears throat> although I'm going to be talking about history, and the history has also been determined by Anne, she asked me to talk about the role of hexoses in, in, defi in defined media as well. <clears throat> but I'd like to start with the present state of this field, and what are some exciting areas? Last week I received the latest issue of Reproduction, the British Journal, in which uh, uh, Renaudo and uh, Richard Schultz have a paper in which describing <coughs> the, uh, the uh, properties of genes in blastocysts produced in two different kinds, these are mouse blastocysts produced in two different media. Witten's media, medium, and uh, Witten, of course, was the first to, very, to show you could culture eight cell embryos to blastocysts in 1956. Uh, the medium has been modified over the next uh, decade, and there are about six versions of it. Now, this is the one that he described in a review in 1971, and you'll see there 114 genes were misexpressed. They also compared that with the media that <coughs> I, was, I uh, developed with, with uh, Joel Lawrence uh, back in, when was that, about 19, 1991, uh, called KSOM, which nowadays is supplemented with amino acids. And this is a very commonly used medium nowadays. And you see that there were 29 genes misexpressed, considerably fewer. So this is a clear demonstration that the solution you put your eggs into can, be a, can affect the embryos by influencing their genes. And this does raise questions about the properties of the cells of the embryos that you produce. 
there, the third item there, I say the f noted that he re reports that 14 of the genes <coughs> were common to the two media, and a very happy thing for me was that nearly all of those genes would be concerned with iron and water transport. And for years I've been saying to people, it's not protein, stupid, it's ions that you have to be considering. <coughs> Now the other area which is influencing this field nowadays, particularly more from the clinical point of view, is <coughs> uh, again it's related to the effects on the embryos, how they deal with stress. Now as you'll see in a minute, all chemically defined media are artificial media. And so when you put embryos or eggs into those media, you're plunging them into a foreign environment and it follows that they are stressed. Back when I was culturing cartilage a long time ago, I studied the distribution of water in organ cultures of embryonic cheekbones and found that they fluctuated and I talked about a life cycle of the, of the organ culture. What was going on was movement of water which I suggested then was a response to stress. Well, looking at this more formally, <coughs> when cells are put in a foreign environment, they try to maintain the set points of their internal environment. They regulate pH, they regulate osmolarity, they regulate the concentrations of, <coughs> of other substances. So one major physiological study that's needed in the study of embryos in vitro are there homeostatic mechanisms? And Jay Baltz in Ottawa and uh, Michelle Lane are two uh, people who are doing a lot of work in this field at the present time, which is straight physiology uh, of embryos. <coughs> we then come to the pathophysiology, where the embryos are reacting adversely to the environment in which you put them. And one of the defense mechanisms that uh, is stimulated under conditions of stress, for example, are the heat shock proteins. And there is a considerable amount of work going on now, since the pioneer work done in France about 15 years ago, on what is happening with the heat shock proteins. And this is also coupled to the fact that oxygen-free radicals are being produced in these media. <coughs> The third thing, which concerns clinicians particularly, and also people concerned in the livestock industry, <coughs> is do these changes that occur in the embryos during the four days or five days you culture them have long-lasting effects? And we know about the large animal, the large animals that occur in rudiment, uh, ruminants when they're born. Uh, there are other examples of this. So there's a very real concern <coughs> and an active, there's a lot of reviews being published in recent years about possible long-term effects of exposure to embryos to a chemically defined medium. Now I think cell stem researchers who are getting into this field in a big way these days should recognize that these sort of problems also apply to stem cells. And it's a, it's a big area of research that's available to those we would like to move into it. <coughs> now, in the first slide I talked about Witten's medium and KSOM with amino acids. Now this is the composition. Is there a pointer here? The, uh, the, the early media use prior, prior to by 19, uh, 1980 were sort of variants of Witten's medium. There's very old, there's Princeton's medium, Witten's medium, my medium, there's a lot of them. They're essentially mixtures of these salts, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, phosphate, magnesium, calcium, 
bicarbonate, plus some energy sources, glucose, lactate and pyruvate, more recently glutamines included, and EDTA, my, uh, albumin, I'm sorry, uh, albumin, usually bovine serum albumin, and amino acids were not used at all in those days. Nowadays, KSOM, you see, has all, all of the same things. It's got glutamine in it and has varying concentrations of the 20 amino acids. Now, it's very common these days to talk about essential and non-essential amino acids. This terminology goes back to nutritional experiments by Rose in 1935, I think it was, uh, which was then sh showed that in, when you feed animals uh, proteins or a certain amino acid you need and others the animal can get by synthesis. And this was then shown to be the case in rats. Then Harry Eagle in 1955, who I had the pleasure of knowing when I started working on chemically defined media, uh, <coughs> came up with essential and non-essential amino acids based on his cell cultures of human cell lines. And this has now permeated the literature on the chemi and the uh, com uh, media companies now sell you packaged essential and non-essential amino acids. There's never been any definitive proof that there are such things as essential and non-essential amino acids in embryos. And I even recommend a review I wrote recently that this terminology be dropped and that we just talk about amino acids on block. Uh, it's a hangover from old work that people have carried over without critically thinking about it. And Henry Lease in England recently has, uh, has come up with the same argument. <coughs> Now the reasons for using chemically defined media are these, and it's interesting from the historical point of view, the first tissue culture experiments that were done were done in Yale in 1907 with the culture of neuronal tissue. Eleven years later, uh, Lewis, I uh, can't think of his first name, and his wife Margaret Lewis, that I can remember, I also had the pleasure of knowing them, uh, remarkably came up with three reasons as to why you should use chemically defined media in tissue culture. And these reasons are not based on any fundamental science, they're based on purely practical considerations. They can be easily reproduced at different times and in different laboratories. They can be varied in a controlled manner by selecting compounds and their concentrations. And they are free of unknown enzymic activities and I've added in italics here on hormones and growth factors to bring it a bit up to date, which may interfere with the responses being studied, and of course more recently pathogen-free viruses and prions. And this has become very important, for example in Europe, the European uh, Authority is trying to make it compulsory with all media to use recombinant proteins, and no natural proteins at all, uh, to put in media. <coughs> Some words that are also used in this field, which I just want to quickly mention, of course, are biological media, which is how it all started, uh, which was serum and uh, chick embryo extract and so forth. Uh, the chemically defined media I just talked about now, the protein-free media. And also you'll see in the literature a purely arbitrary classification that the original media had about 12 components. A lot of others that are used more nowadays have many more than that. But you'll see in the literature, simple and complex. Uh, again, that probably should be dropped nowadays. Now, when you look at the chemically defined media, <coughs> they're really made up of several components. And you can see this in this uh, Venn, Venn diagram. If this is all the circle embraces all the known chemicals in the world, there is this subset here, which are the body constituents, and then there inside of the body here of a female that would be o the oviduct fluid constituents. And it's impossible for us to make up a complete imitation of oviduct fluid constituents. What we usually end up with, uh, with a medium based of up, shown by the red circle, 
which is largely made up of body constituents, the inorganic ions and salts and uh, a few other things. Uh, <coughs> there is seldom any ingredients that are specific to the oviduct included. Maybe some people have tried to do that. And then there are chemicals that are entirely synthetic and foreign to, the, to, the na to nature. Of course, EDTA, which is used in all medium, would be an example of that. <coughs> now, if you set about designing a, a medium, this is a difficult problem. There are two main things you have to decide. What you put in the medium, and this is usually in the past has been done by accident, it's based on a bit of physiology. It's usually based on the, the uh, physiological salines of ringer and tyroid and so on back in and Krebs in the old days, supplemented with energy sources. And then as people discovered vitamins, and, or, or they became more exactly, they discovered them, but they became available to buy vitamins and amino acids and so forth. So the media got more complicated. Sometimes it was based on some reasonable basic physiology. Other uh, cases, it's sheer guesswork. Uh, it's interesting following, uh, talking about a bit of history. When I was working in Cambridge in England, defining with, with cell, cell culture media for cell lines, in England you couldn't buy any amino acids. They weren't available. We had to get them given us as presents from our friends in, in the States. That was in 1954. Mm -hmm. So things have come a long way since then. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we come to the part that I'm particularly interested in is once you've decided on a set of compounds to put in the media, how you choose their concentrations. Now there have been two approaches to the problem. Uh, one here, which I'll take this one first, but the back to nature strategy. You might think that if you could analyze what's in the overduct and find its concentrations, that's what you should put in the media. Sounds very plausible and it appeals to a lot of people. But it doesn't always work. And I realize this, uh, <coughs> um, first of all, <coughs> when in the 1980s, Claude Lachene at Harvard, who was working on the uh, microchemistry of the uh, renal uh, nephron, uh, had very sensitive microfluorometric assays, which we learned from him and applied to to the measure of the all the ions in microsamples of the oviduct fluid. And we found that there was very high potassium concentration, which has been confirmed. And so we said, oh, that's great, we'll put the high concentration in our medium, and the embryos promptly died. They just went necrotic. They didn't like that concentration at all. And that sort of raised flags that maybe that, that approach isn't so great. Uh, two other examples that are well known. Embryos do not like developing in the osmolarity you find in the oviduct, which is about 300 milli osmoles. It's got to be done down something like 285. The pH in the overduct is up 7.56 like that. In culture, they like 7.2. So there are these sort of differences. Now the reason for this is because you put them in an artificial environment, and some of the hemis, uh, some of the uh, uh, homeostatic mechanisms just can't work. That's the sort of general explanation of this. Now, the, if you can't do this, I mean, it is useful to some extent, but you shouldn't be surprised if it doesn't work. It's to let the animals choose strategy, and this is really doing a bioassay, that you vary the concentrations of compounds and see what happens. And the usual thing, concentration you end up choosing is the maximum. Now this also is not so simple uh, for the following reasons. If you just take a, a medium, say with 12 components in it, and say for example glucose, and you set up media with six different concentrations of glucose, put your embryos in it and see how many go to blastocysts, you'll get a result. But is it the real result that you want? 
And the answer probably is no. If you look at this graph, I've put it, this is that shape of this surface here, it was actually determined experimentally. I'm not going to tell you what the components are at the moment. But if you vary one component along here and another component along here, and we did this by making 16 media with four concentrations of this and four concentrations of this, making all combinations, did the experiment and then got the results and fitted a two-dimensional regression surface to the data. And we got this curve. And you can see it's a hill that it goes up in different ways. But you can see if we chose this concentration and held this one constant, I'm sorry, ch ch chose, well, what doing? chose, kept this one constant and varied this one, we would be determining our line along here, or one along here, or one along here. They, they would not be the same. They'd have different slopes. And so this would not give you the maximum result. If you do the two together, then you can see there's a point up here. So you have to remember that when you vary, uh, if you just decide to throw in a single compound and vary it, it may be interacting with other components in the media and not giving its full potential. And so you would really ideally want to study all the comp variations in together. Well, if you have 10 components and you want to do an experiment like this, the min minimum number of doses you should, or concentrations you should use is three, because if you just have two, that will just give you a straight line. It won't tell you about the shape of the curve. Three, and if you have 10, the number of media to make up is three to the power of 10, <laughs> which is about 300,000 media. So you can't do that as a control. But uh, I've always been interested in this. I wrote a paper with some colleagues in Cambridge in 1957 about modeling media for the study of growth factors in culture and coming up with this, but there was no way of really doing the sums or the experiments or the sums. The advent of computers has made all the difference here and also the development of a technique which is called sequential simplex optimization. And here what you do is, is you make up a medium which you hope is on some sort of surface uh, which may give you a starting point here and then you do experiments in sequence. I haven't got time to go into how this is done in detail but the whole idea is to, is to find the shortest way up that hill to the top. And we did this to develop the medium S SRM, not KSRM, which I'll have to explain that in a minute. Joel Latz and I did this. It took two years of doing sequential experiments, slowly crawling up this hill, which of course is in higher dimensional space, 11 dimensional space if you want it accurate with 10 compounds, and found the medium that got rid of the two cell block, which was interfering with development uh, embryological uh, development of biology studies in a big way uh, back in the 19, 1980s. It's interesting that in about 1984, the NIH began to, be, to realize that media were a limitation in a lot of work that needed to be done, and they had actually an in-house meeting which I attended to discuss what should be done and I remember early at that meeting saying that I wouldn't waste time writing a grant application to develop a media because all the study sections I knew about would turn it down as dull and uninteresting. And so the special uh, call for research applications in a <coughs> cooperative program was set up which led to the tissue culture, so called Tissue Culture Club, which ran for 14 years. And all that I'm going to talk about now, including the development of KSI with this method, was due to the efforts of the six people, sort of more than that, probably different times. They did, the people varied. About eight people were involved over that 14 year period in developing media. <coughs> so, this is just quickly the sort of technology that was used to develop KSOM, which is 
let the embryo choose principle. I, that's what I call it. There, some of my friends don't like that phrase at all, but that's another matter. <clears throat> so we ended up with this medium KSOM, which had some strange results here. The sodium chloride had been reduced considerably from what it was in other media. The sodium potassium chloride went way down for reasons that we don't know. And glucose was down too, to about 0.2. Uh, and lactate had been reduced from what's in other media, those earlier media that I mentioned. We did, uh, did some other work with the electron probe on the measuring the intracellular concentrations of ions in, in the single blastomeres. This was Claude O'Shea and uh, myself and uh, Borland. And it was as a result of those figures, which didn't agree with this sort of thing, that we adjusted those numbers for potassium in particular, which gave rise to the KSOM that most of you will have heard of. So there was a bit of fanaticing here. We didn't completely believe the let the embryo choose business. We modified it a little bit. But it ended up with a medium that we eventually found. The two-cell block had developed from all the strains that we looked at. Uh, but the, the payoff of all of it was that this medium produced beautiful blastocysts with high cell numbers and good inner cell masses. <coughs> Since then, further developments have taken place. SOM became KSOM. And the, what I particularly want to talk about here is glucose. And at the same time, well, first of all, I want to give you some background of the early work on glucose. In 1956, Witten published his pioneer paper which showed you could culture <coughs> eight cell mouse embryos to the blastocyst in, uh, in, uh, in a simple media, which is an original Witten's medium. The reason that you couldn't culture the first three cleavage divisions to the eight cell stage appeared to be the fact that uh, glucose could not be used by embryos at that stage. Then serendipitously, in the next year, Witten published a, another paper in 1957 which showed that if you put lactate in the medium, you could start at the two cell stage. And it showed that some lactate presumably provides an energy source and it couldn't be supplied by glucose. And then uh, Whittingham and Donahue and myself following along on that work, <coughs> this was all done in my lab at Penn where Bridster was my graduate student in Whittingham. Uh, we showed that the maturation of oocytes in vitro and the first cleavage division needed pyruvate. And the reason pyruvates in all the culture media used these days goes back to that observation. And so we had this sequence that sometimes in neurogenesis there appeared to be a restriction in the use of glu glucose, which was, uh, and the embryo relied on pyruvate, the oocyte and the egg relied on pyruvate, and then over three previous divisions the more normal adult state was restored. The development of the microfluorometric techniques with, uh, with uh, Claude Lachey and led Henry Lees, who went back to England and applied those methods to measure the uptake of various substances from the medium. Instead of measuring what was in the egg, you put the eggs, culture them, and see what disappeared. And so he was able to measure on single mouse egg preparations the uptake of pyruvate and glucose. And this is a slide from 1984. You can see pyruvate is used fairly extensively here. At the time when the Mario Lake plunges, glucose is used at a very low level, and at the time of the Mario, Mario Lake, it takes off. And so you've got, <coughs> this sort of agrees uh, with the uh, culture work that glucose does not support development until the eight cell stage and beyond. And then in the culture club, a bomb was thrown into all of this by Barry Bannister, who published a paper in uh, two years after that club started with Sheeney and Bannister, 
showing that with hamster embryos, that if you took phosphate and glucose out, you would remove the two cell block that occurred in those embryos. The hypothesis was that glucose and phosphate inhibit development of the early embryo. And in that club, Zyamek, uh, <coughs> um, I left her name out of the references here. And it should be Carol Zyamek, the, the senior person, should be on here. Did this work and confirmed in the mouse, the random bred mice that always had two cell blocks, that if you took uh, the uh, a Witten type medium and just took glucose and phosphate out, and just had lactate and pyruvate, that the glutamine that the two cell block de developed. And so it came uh, to be thought that glucose in the culture media for embryos was inhibitory. We repeated this work in my lab with Whittingham's M16 medium, which is a common medium used years ago, and sure enough, glucose seemed to be inhibitory. And then a sort of mini bandwagon developed in the culture field. Within just uh, three or four years, six papers were published were saying, yes, glucose and phosphate are inhibitory. In the rat, three papers, sheep, one paper, the cow, one paper, and the human, four papers. And this had a major impact because almost immediately in the human field, Quinn, as one person, made a medium, a modified medium HTF, which is a, a human embryo culture medium, without glucose and phosphate, and it seemed to work. And so advertisements started telling the world that glucose is inhibitory, but they were wrong. And this has been fighting this for years about the way that glucose is inhibitory. Here, <coughs> In this paper, we used a newly developed SOM medium and studied the effects of glucose and found there was no inhibition at all. This is quite different from all that other work. Also, if you look in the literature, there was one paper, I think it was from Thompson in, uh, in New Zealand, <coughs> studying sheep. They thought glucose was inhibitory. It was, uh, it was uh, it stimulated development. And then there are uh, two papers which uh, Linda McGuinness, who's in the audience, when she used to work on sheep, uh, uh, said there was no effect. And in the pig, also, there is no effect, although uh, there was some controversy about this at one time, but it was over the misinterpretation of data. So there we have a challenge to what had become virtually dogma in the embryo culture field. And then, <coughs> by 1988, Michael Summers, who was a fellow in the OBGYN department at Harvard, came to me and said he wanted to work on in vitro fertilization in mice and wanted to use their new medium. And I said, well, it won't work. There's only 0.2 millimoles of glucose in the medium. And for sperm to fertilize eggs, it's known you need to have glucose around. And I said, but never mind, I don't think glucose is inhibitory in our medium. We'll bump it up to blood level of 5.56 millimolars and see what happens. And sure enough, we got beautiful in vitro fertilization and development. And you can see here, raising the concentration from 0 0.2 to 5.4, we got 84, 83, 81, 84 with cell counts, which in this medium in those days were pretty good cell counts. And <clears throat> although so this was actually to, uh, culturing uh, embryos, showing that uh, they was not inhibitory, as we found, say, with medium M16, uh, if you did fertilization in vitro, you got exactly the same results as I'm showing you here. More recently, <clears throat> I, uh, Linda McGuinness and I did a factorial experiment in which Using KSOM, we varied the phosphate concentration in the KSOM and also the glucose concentration. 
ranging from 0.2 up to 5.6, and I can't remember what these cons. No, the con. No, these are in logs here. I can't switch that back. Um, and did, did the uh, determine the percentage of blast assist that developed and fitted this uh, response service for the two of them together. And this is the situation with respect to KSOM. There is no inhibition by glucose. There is a very slight inhibition with phosphate. So whatever Sheeney and Bannister and all those other people were doing when they found inhibitory, it was not their fault. That was a, they all got very good results. It's just that the effects you get can depend on other, composite, other components of the media. And to sort of end this uh, part of my uh, talk here, I put up this, <coughs> this is from a review that I wrote some time ago. Okay. There are four media that have been used for culturing mouse embryos at one time or another. KSOM, M16, e EMSGP, which uh, Scott uh, used, Scott and Whittingham, and this hemotubal fluid of Quinn. <coughs> in these three media, glucose is always inhibitory. In this medium, it's not inhibitory. And when you look along there, it's not at all obvious why this should be, but it is. And at the moment, there's been no other work done on this, so we, we had no further grants in which to sort of pursue this sort of work. But this does provide a, a warning about the dangers of studying one compound at a time and thinking you're going to find a solution to all your problems. You're not. You may easily muddy the water, as this, these glucose studies show, by several people done honestly uh, over the, that period of some 15 years. Now I'd just like to <coughs> say a bit more about this, what I call the SOM family of media. I've talked about this. This is KSOM with glucose raised up to blood level, 5.56 millimoles per litre. In uh, 1995, uh, John Epic and Richard Schultz, and a um, person of the name of Hilo, I can't remember his first name, at the Jackson Lab, uh, were started doing all their work on oocyte maturation and uh, subsequent development of nice eggs that had been matured in vitro. And <coughs> They started working with our newly developed KSOM. They were all part of this tissue culture group. <coughs> and based on the work of others that had been done earlier, going back to Bridge Directory in the 60s, but uh, promoted a lot in more recent times by David Gardner, added, and I think Ed, you were doing some of this too, um, uh, added amino acids to KSOM. And they published the, the first of their papers that showed that adding amino acids made a huge difference to the growth of the blastocyst in KSOM. They were bigger and many more cells. But they, oh, it was this medium and this work which first put them onto the fact that the media would influence the expression of genes during the course of development of the embryos in vitro. Nowadays, for routine use in our lab, or what was my lab since I've closed it down now, uh, is this medium, which is really a fusion of all this. We use all tiny amino acids, but at half the strength that Eagle used in its work for human cell lines, and also bumped up the glucose. I'm still not <coughs> sure about what concentration of glucose to recommend. If I go back to that chart here, you may say, why in the simplex optimization did we wind up with 0.2 millimole? Well, as you go up the hill and you get to a plateau, you start wandering around. And you have to make a decision to stop somewhere. And since this is clearly a plateau, 
there is a very wide range where we could have stopped those experiments for the concentration of glucose. And we happened to stop it when it was low. Uh, we weren't aware of the inhibitory effects that might have been going on. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether you use 0.2 or go to 0.5.5. In the <coughs> overduct fluid, the, kind of the concentration is about 3 millimoles. So you might as well go back to back to nature principle here and use what is found in nature. And I think KSOM has been used now for some time to come may have the three millimole glucose. Now I think I've emphasized here that designing media is a, is a tricky business. It's very empirical uh, and you should be aware that it is empirical, that it will therefore stress the embryos and may produce side effects that you weren't anticipating. Another aspect of this is whether it's necessary to subculture media. David Gardner and Richard Lane have been big promoters of the use of two-step culture procedures in the human. And you certainly can produce beautiful blastocysts with their, their procedures and with good numbers of inner cell mass cells and uh, uh, trifectoderm cells. Uh, but the question is whether it's really necessary to do that if you've got a good medium. And <coughs> see, I've got ahead of myself. Uh, Catherine Rakoski and I did some work with human embryos comparing a two-step culture procedure where you renew the medium at the eight cell stage, uh, actually changing the nature of the medium. It's a different composition before eight cells and a different one later. With our KSOM, we culture straight through five days with no change of medium. And we produce beautiful looking human blastocysts in the medium this way. So it does uh, question the real need to do the two-step procedure. Uh, it's, the problem is getting clinics to do this because once they've got a nice procedure going, they don't want to change it. Uh, but in my view, is that there are companies, there are many companies now selling their two-step culture methods. Many of them will not divulge the composition of their media, and they're charging big sums of money which the patients pay for, which I think may be quite unnecessary. And uh, I've been fighting a battle as editor, as editorial assistant, associate editor of human reproduction, to try and <coughs> do something about this. I was at a meeting in Madrid of the editorial board last year and proposed that we not accept any paper that uses media of secret composition. That wasn't popular. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't popular. I was sitting between the head of the clinic in the Karolinska Institute and the head of the clinic of Baylor and pointed out in nine certain terms that if we adopted that policy, there would be no papers published out of human clinics. <laughs> but it is an issue. We've been taken over by commercial interests. The people are doing research using these secret media which I think is very bad. And I, there are no signs that exactly the same thing is happening in the stem cell research mm -hmm. thing. So as scientists, we need to watch that. Uh, I want to go back to this slide here in mice. This is a two-step cult. I don't, I don't ignore the garden medium here. We just use that as a sort of control, which is a very good control. But here we cultured mice from the one cell stage to the eight cell, renewed the medium, they went to blastocysts, or just did it straight. And you can see the inner cell mass count was 34, the 36 here with straight culture, with the numbers of trivectoderm cells, 138 when you subcultured, 133 when you just went through. There's no need for this medium and that set up to go into this two-step culture procedure with these criteria. Now there may be other reasons for, for doing it for the subculture, but not based on this. The other thing I'd like to point out, you can see with this media with amino acids and the high glucose, what good cell counts we get. You were seeing counts of 50 and 60 10 years ago. Now we're up here with very good looking blastocysts. And these uh, techniques may be important to understand 
when you're going to start producing blastocysts from cloud embryos because you're taking them through the same culture of business uh, to get to the blastocysts in order to isolate the stem cells. Now Anne asked me to <coughs> just say something about the uh, culture of embryos where the dip diploid clowns uh, I've never worked on this and all I can do is look at the literature. I, last week I've looked at several papers in both the mouse and the human and all I can say is it's a horrible mess. <laughs> <laughs> this is a paper published by Latham who's done some very nice work and come up with a very interesting observation. I'm not uh, degrading what the work's been done. But he, uh, let it be known, the KSOM of the amino acids, which contained 0.2 glucose, millimolar glucose, gave very poor yields of blastocysts from these diploid clones. Uh, <coughs> Yanagamachi has been doing this, and he and his people have tried KSOM, and for reasons I don't understand, they found KCB medium better. And they, which had no glucose in it, and they supplemented with glucose, and they get, uh, they got better results. And then Latham has got involved into this two-step culture business, uh, which I've shown here. But you can see that all of this has 5.6, well, the Witten's medium, which worked reasonably better, not much. I mean, 38% isn't very good. Uh, had 5.56 millimolar glucose. This one, where you subcultured from one medium to another, that led with 22%. Here you did this, and this is a dreadful thing to do to embryos. You go from high glucose and plunge it into low glucose just when it needs it. And same this experiment here. But you get some sort of lonely, none of this is significantly different. I did the, the, uh, the statistical test on this to see but what he does report in that paper is that 94% of parthenogenic embryos developed a blastocyst in KSOM. And so in that paper he says, when you put an adult nucleus into an embryo, it's going to determine what it needs in culture. In other words, adult cells need to have glucose in the surrounding culture media in order for it to develop. <clears throat> what does not seem to be done so far, and I haven't had the opportunity to talk to Latham about it, as to whether he's put glucose in here and used our latest KSOM medium to see if they then uh, develop well. But there, uh, I mean, this is typical of the sort of work that's being done. There are other people doing it, and there's not been much consideration given to the nature of the media that they're using. The, using ones that they can purchase easily because it's if you make I mean in the early days I used to make up these compound flex media it's be a whole day weighing compounds. Uh, <coughs> you can buy them and they take them off the shelf and probably don't read anything about them and hope they work. Uh, the Korean paper was the other one I had asked me to look at because there they recommended using Gluco uh, replacing glucose in the medium with fructose. And I was intrigued why this should be so. We've known since the work of Chang in the 1950s of the uh, Worcester Foundation that rabbit embryos could metabolize fructose. There's a paper published those days. Uh, Bannister, I think, of about 1996, published a paper in which he showed with hamsters that fructose could substitute for glucose. Uh, I looked carefully at the uh, methods that Wang, the Koreans used, Wang in, in uh, science in 2004. They cultured their diploid human clones in medium G12. That's one of these secret uh, media put out by In Vitro Life, designed by <coughs> Gardner. And then after that, then put it into this medium called MSOFAA in which glucose has been replaced with fructose at a concentration of 1.5 millimole per litre. Now this is adapted from work on the car. 
SOS, S SOF, was a medium that was designed by uh, Turvit in uh, Turvit, uh, I think, uh, Whittingham and Ryson in Cambridge in the animal research uh, lab that labs there, Cambridge in England, based on what they knew about the composition of cattle oviduct fluid. And that was a medium just consisting of inorganic salts and energy sources, very much like the Witten medium or, or the KSO, the original KSOM. And then it was modified in various ways, uh, <coughs> which we uh, needn't go into here, the addition of the EDTA and a few other things, and then amino acids. And they added these essential amino acids something like two times the normal strength of, a, of essential and one time the non-essential. There's no basis for doing that at all, but that's the way they did that. But they obtained 25% blastocyst, which is pretty good with this. Uh, when you look at the, 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 the replacement with fructose, it's not based on any work done with human embryos. If you go back to the earlier paper on the car where they did this, this is the only evidence there is. They had 120 embryos in, the, in this medium uh, containing one millimole of glucose and got 23 blastocysts, which you know, is a poor yield. It's about what was talked about after the last paper. They used, used fructose and got 33 out of 126. The probability of that being statistically significant is 0.09, which is not very impressive. I quite frankly don't believe this work. I, mean, I believe the result, but I don't believe it's got any significance at all. <coughs> Instead of playing around with hexoses, you might as well um, <coughs> just stick with the, with the glucose. But you can see from this limited work that there is a long way to go and a big opportunities, I think, to do more clinical work on M media development for the production of stem cells and particularly to study what these media have on the genetic expression in those stem cells and, and the way they differentiate. Now, to wind up my talk, I've just got three, three more slides. In the early days of tissue culture, going back to after it started in 1907, everybody was focused on feeding the cells. They grew and they needed to be fed. And so everybody thought about nutrients. And this went on until only about 20 years ago when it started changing. Everybody said they need this, as this is an essential component. Now we realize that we have to understand, particularly when we come to developmental biology, about signals that have to be supplied and there is something known about this, but we need a lot more. But what I've been interested in is the core environment. Keeping those health so healthy with proper hemo uh, homeostasis, their ability to maintain the essential set points inside their cytoplasm and nucleus in order to maintain proper, maintain proper metabolism. And so the study of stress is as much important as the study of nu nutrients. I couldn't help putting this slide up. I'm not going to explain it because I can't. <laughs> this was in science last week. But I couldn't help putting it in because it's a paper about the effects, or it includes a discussion about the effects of dumping galactose and other hexose in a culture of, back of some bacterium. And these are all the things you have to think about. It's, these are, this is not a metabolic network. These are spots for all activation of genes. And this is part of the new subject that's being started. Systems are now systems biology. And all the universities are plunging into this. At Harvard Medical School, we have one year old department of system biology. This is the sort of stuff they, they study. <laughs> it makes me shudder. It reminds me of my days when I was a student and I had to learn metabolic pathways. <laughs> so I've been stressing, I've been talking about stress all the time. I just summarize it's very unlikely that we can completely recreate the chemical <coughs> environment to which the embryos are exposed as they travel from the site of fertilization to the uterus. 
And all we can do is optimize the media, I think, to, to minimize stress. Now, to finally conclude, again, I want to <coughs> talk a little bit about history, about how you should use these chemically defined media. Physiological salines are chemically defined media. And the first one was Ringer Solution, which was developed, described in 1881 to study the isolated frog heart. They chopped the heart out of the frog, put it in petri dishes with this solution, varied the ions, and that's how they determined what ions are important to regulate the heartbeat. Those experiments lasted about, we used to do them in, in physiology classes with students. Those experiments lasted hour, maybe. The embryos didn't, uh, so the tissues didn't have a chance to get stressed too much in those, and you were able to reach some conclusions. Krebs and Heisen's light in 1932 developed the well known Krebs ringer bicarbonate, which a lot of cultural media for embryos are based on, to study metabolic slices. And from all this work, we got the Krebs cycle. Those were short, short term experiments, and there wasn't time for the tissues to fall apart. When you start to culture for a longer period of time, and this started in plant work in 1946 with chemically defined media and animals, 1947, you're going to know culture for as long as possible, days, weeks, months. Now you have a chance for stress to change what you've got in the test tube. And you should be aware of this. If, if you're doing basic research, it's very important. It may not matter, provided you understand it. If you're doing developmental biology work, so to studying limb, limb formation by culturing limb buds in vitro, you may uh, do experiments that are sufficiently short for stresses not to interfere too much. But when you come to clinical applications, it's a totally different story. If you do this, these manipulations with human tissues, or animal tissues for that matter, if you're cleaning through, uh, you want to be absolutely sure that what changes are produced by long exposure of embryos or stem cells in culture, what genetic, what changes are being produced that might be permanently imprinted into them, whether genetically or otherwise, you need to know about it because they could be highly dangerous. And in the uh, human uh, <coughs> Uh, reproduction literature now there's more and more reviews being published all the time about this last question what are the long term effects of manipulating embryos in vitro uh, particularly in these media and of course doing surgical things on embryos too I mean, people always say well people are saying well these uh, the media aren't very good for culturing the cloned embryos because uh, we're only getting 25-30% embryos. It must be the media. It probably may not be, you know. You're beating those embryos up pretty badly when you take a nucleus out and put another one back. And a lot of them aren't going to survive too much. So I wouldn't be too discouraged by low responses. Thank you.